With the first of two fireside chats, so we're going to burn the hotel down, and I'm going to hand over to my colleague, Nikhil Gokhale, head of research for IBS Intelligence, to tell you who he's talking to. Uh, it's not the best kept secret. I think the, the name is right up here in the brochure. Uh, my pleasure to welcome... <laughs> my pleasure to welcome Sam Everington, CEO of Engine by Stalling. Uh, he's the one responsible for implementing uh, and delivering Stalling's tech platform across a number of financial institutions across the world. Uh, let's put our hands together. Sam, if you could join me. Look, thank you. Thank you. It's great to be here. Uh, I'm going to jump straight in. So the, the title uh, of, uh, uh, of the Fireside Chat has a few interesting words there, and I, I hope to cover all of them bit by bit. So let's start by... Uh, customer service, right? Uh, what according to you, what, what does customer service to you really mean, especially given your experience at Starling? Yeah, it's, uh, it's, it's something that's been really foundational to Starling, I guess. It's a lot of the reason the, the bank exists. It was to break the cycle, basically, that banks could either focus on optimizing operational cost or optimizing service. They were in inherently in conflict in, in most organizations. Uh, and the, the idea behind it was with the right technology foundations kind of rethinking the core of the bank and the, the organizational structure, we could break that cycle and get Starling to the top of the customer satisfaction tables, uh, which thanks to the, the CMA surveys, we, we know we've done for, for the last few years very successfully, whilst having some of the lowest operating costs in the industry. And I, I don't know if anyone's read Starling's annual report from uh, the last couple of weeks, but it made 301 million pounds of profit on 680. Two million of turnover, uh, very good net interest margins, some of the lowest operating costs uh, in the industry. I think all in operating cost per customer is about 30. Uh, yeah, 38, 40 pounds a year, uh, of, of which about seven pounds is technology and the, and, and the rest is staff, which is focused on a really, really high level of service. So we're digitally native as a bank, kind of digital first in the channels and the interactions, but actually customer service is all about being accessible when, when you need to be. So banking is a trust industry. Uh, and to trust a bank, particularly when you, when you don't exist physically, when branches are becoming less and less accessible, you need to be able to get someone a hold of someone when you have concerns. It's a it's very emotive money is, uh, and so we've gone totally the other way to everyone else. We make our contact center extremely accessible. There is no no IVRs, no menus, no chatbots, no attempt to bounce you at all. If you pick up the phone, you will get routed straight through to a human twenty four seven, and that's pretty unique in in retail and small business banking. And to do that at the the profit levels, at the margins, the banks returning kind of 30 plus percent return on tangible equity it's, it's brilliant you you just mentioned i think in a few words customer service is being available when you need it uh, you know and you also you know uh, spoke about you pick up the phone customer service they it goes directly to a human right uh, help me understand that a little better because you know you also said that you know uh, there's a cost element attached to if the if the phone call goes directly to a human being there's a there's a cost attached to it you need to have redundancies uh, in in your call centers how do you still manage to make profits yeah <laughs> and, and that, that's always been the conflict it, if your digital channels are good enough if you can genuinely do everything you need to do as a customer through the digital channels in an easy convenient obvious delightful way to use it the contact levels are, are fundamentally low they're those really difficult complex problems or often related to financial crime that real moment of stress when the trust in the institution is on the line and so we invest very very heavily in the technology systems and in automation and in really proactively communicating with customers whenever we can uh, the, the app might look on the surface now like a traditional bank app but there's a lot of subtle differences that have been built in baked in because of the way we've developed the technology platform that 
allow us to much more proactively communicate with customers to quite proactively answer their questions so the contact levels are, are much lower than the norm. And, and ultimately, that's what allows us to, to make the return we do. That's brilliant. I think, you know, uh, while it may be have become a normal way of working at Starling, I think, you know, that, that one sentence is brilliant because, you know, reducing the number of calls and uh, that, that go to a contact center and uh, being proactive in your communication, I think, in theory, it seems very simple, but that's not in, in practice. It's easy. incredibly difficult to do. <laughs> so that that's my next question. You know, in theory, it's simple. In theory, it's logical. Why can't banks still do it? What's stopping them? Yeah, uh, decades of complexity is the the short answer. There's. They're, they're big, complex institutions. They've evolved over many, many years uh, to a myriad of different systems with lots of connection points. And, and, and fundamentally, there's been a, a level of underinvestment, I think, in, in most banks. My, my career before this was replacing systems in, in big banks and auto manufacturers. I've seen inside a, a lot of them uh, when I was consulting, effectively. Um, and uh, banks are run... And probably the biggest philosophical, philosophical difference is how we, we run the bank. Most banks are run for the shareholders first, then probably customers second and staff third. Uh, inside Starling, it, it's the total inverse of that. They put the staff first, the customers second, the shareholders last. And that's the decision-making process. Uh, and so by investing in the right tools, the right technology platforms to make our staff efficient and satisfied, they inherently serve customers better. We then build features and capabilities into the platform that genuinely solve problems for customers. They have no business case. Uh, the theory being that the profits would follow because you will organically grow a, a bank fairly effectively with happy customers who, who ultimately stick with you. Uh, and, and if you scale that, you should be able to make a return on it. It was That's quite a tough sell to VCs eight no, years no. ago. No, no, no. <laughs> so look, you know, I think you're evading the question. You know, so what are the three things uh, that you think that you are doing differently that other banks have not been able to do, you know, to crack this simple problem? You know, so in the morning, Chetan mentioned uh, customer obsession, yep. right? And I think you're starting to go there yep. when you say that, you know, shareholders come last, yep. right? Uh, but what are the three things that other banks haven't managed? So what's the secret sauce, if I may? Uh, at, at the start, it's having the right core system. Um, Everyone else has wrapped the mainframe. We all, we all know there's mainframes sat at the center of every major bank. Uh, there's only so far you can push the experience, you can push the automation, you can push the information sharing if you've got old batch systems with limited capacity on them sat, sat at the foundations of it. And so we started from the core of the bank uh, in, in developing the technology platforms and then built all the, all the richly integrated supporting services around. So that, that's the single biggest difference that is incredibly hard to replicate. Then n number two is we put all, all the products, all the customer types on the, on the same platform through the same experience. So uh, retail, small business, the different savings products, the different lending products, even the credit cards, the system supports, they're, they're all on one single richly integrated system. So customers get the same consistent experience, the same app to, to manage all those products. But more importantly, the staff on the operations side do. Uh, and that's where the customer service comes from. If you pick up the phone and talk to those humans in the Starling Contact Center, they can see everything about every product, and they have every button, every capability our system offers at, at their fingertips, subject to the right role-based access. There's no internal ticketing system. There's no handoffs between teams. We can resolve the vast majority of contact at first point. Uh, and I think that uh, that's very, very hard to you replicate. Know, you know, you, you're giving us the secret sauce, but you're basically saying that there's no secret. It's open secret. <laughs> you just have to get it done, you know, right every single time, isn't it's, it? Uh, yeah, it's, it's easy to say. It's, it's, it's taken eight difficult years. I, I joined Starling as a 20-person startup, and it's now a 4,000-person company. It's, it's been I, a challenging yeah. journey. I'm not, I'm not pretending this is something you can solve <laughs> overnight. <laughs> but I think it's brilliant because, you know, I think you've got something right there. And uh, let, let's keep, keep, keep the conversation forward, right? Uh, and I think somewhere in the morning, you, you touched upon customer loyalty uh, not being any award any longer. You know, you know people uh, will not bank with, uh, with a bank uh, for, for their lifetime, right? And they will have multiple. There's probably nothing called a primary bank and a secondary bank. It's going, just going to be a case where, you know, for this requirement, I go to this bank. For this requirement, I go to this bank. 
So how do you actually, you know, uh, engineer for success in that sense, right? Because uh, do you actually look at, uh, you know, growing? How do you how do you go about growing your business? How do you go about, uh, you know, growing your, uh, you know, your your wallet share from each customer uh, when you know clearly that you know they may not want you for every single uh, requirement of theirs. Uh, don't try to be all, all things to all people. Uh, as you say, people, people have a primary financial institution for each product, but they're often now different institutions and that they stay over time. So the products you are focusing on, the products you're offering, make those as, as good and as differentiated as they can be. We consciously invest in features all the time that solve problems for customers that are, are hard for other banks to, to replicate that will take time to catch up with. And so if you can stay ahead of the curve, it, it's very hard to, to convince yourself to switch from being the first bank to put the gambling block in, which uh, I, I know from <laughs> uh, people inside big banks. A, a big bank CEO phoned up the tech team and said, this is great, can we have it? It took them 18 months to put a gambling block in that took a week to deliver on, on Starling's technology platform. <laughs> so some of them are just hard to catch up with. Uh, we, we built something to hide payment references for Ruby's relationships. So there's, there's lots we do that just solve problems for little groups of customers. And then we build the kind of rich, personalizable, sticky things that are really hard to address on a traditionally structured core system. So the, the things we can do with spaces, especially in assigning bills and virtual cards to them and splitting up your income, my spaces look absolutely nothing like someone else's, but they are feature rich in a way that just can't readily be replicated at, at other banks that have a, a system where the account, the person and the card and the account number and sort code are largely one and the same and interchangeable there. We have a, a bizarre data model that gives us a real flexibility. It's very interesting, you know, the way you put it. That uh, you know, you don't, you know, you don't want to be uh, be there for everything. You know, so you want just want to become, you know, uh, very very. You want to become the primary bank for something very special. Yeah, and uh, you had to be everything when some of the products were borderline loss leading and upsold the higher margin products. So a lot of the upselling has obviously been restricted by regulations over the last ten years anyway. But also fundamentally, our current accounts are profitable mm -hmm. and so we don't need to do everything else we make real money just growing the the deposit side of the book yeah i think absolutely i think and there is enough growth opportunities uh, you know when you expand geographically right so you know i think that could be one way to say that you know this is my sweet spot of customers and there are enough customers across the globe uh, for me at least in the next maybe decade <laughs> to grow, right? So it's a great strategy. I think, you know, uh, it's something that you perfected. So, you know, uh, tell me a little bit more about, you know, how do you expand geographically as, you know, so maybe I'm bleeding into, uh, uh, into, into engine more and less of Starling. In yeah, this. I think it's where we're taking a very different approach to most fintechs. It's, it's public knowledge. Starling was originally planning to go into Ireland. Brexit stopped that the first time. Uh, when the licenses ceased to exist, we then went through the licensing process in Ireland, uh, which took several years, as, as banking licenses do. Um, and when, when we got to the end of that journey, nearly three years ago now, we were looking at actually, like, what is the difference with this bank? What can it do differently? What can differentiate it? Building a brand and the trust and the local knowledge and the operations teams is a very, very difficult journey, uh, as, as we had just been through. And so can, can we scale that? Can we differentiate that? Not, not hugely yet, eventually, but it, it's a slow journey. A, a lot of banks, meanwhile, were, were turning up in London, kind of visiting Starling, trying to work out how it was one of the few profitable digital banks, especially pre-interest rates, when the, when the base rates were back at zero. Uh, how is it making money and satisfying customers? Uh, and a lot of those ended in, can we, can we work together? Can we co-invest? Can we partner to try and bring replicate Starling in, in another country? And, and Engine's almost the answer to that as well. It's like actually, we've got this unique technology stack that lets us run this delightful but very cost-efficient bank. And we've also got the knowledge in how to use it. Uh, my, my consulting life before, you turn up at a financial institution and understand their processes, their products, try and map them onto the system, that kind of incremental improvement and digitalizing what's there. We've got 4 million customers and spent eight years now optimizing the customer journeys, optimizing the operating processes, the servicing tools. And so we arrive 
with Engine with a running bank can walk through the process and then you're configuring it to the bank's products and tweaking, adjusting, configuring the journeys to, to the local market norms, the regulations. And so we can you, deliver you, at a very different pace. You, you, you have a, already a brilliant case study to showcase in <laughs> styling. So, you know, it, it must be easier. But, you know, look, no conversation uh, in any of you know, sessions today in t on technology is complete without AI, yeah. <laughs> right? So uh, let's talk about it. You know, what the, what are the two or three things that you are investing in? Uh, maybe investing is a very strong word, but you think will change the way customer service is looked at? What are the two or three use cases, if I may use the word? Yeah, uh, I think almost more interesting is what are we not investing in? We had a or we've always had a strong feeling as a management team that nobody enjoys talking to to an AI service, to a chatbot. And so as a principle, they have always been banned. Uh, if you are talking to it, your response will be coming from a human. So we do use AI tools inevitably, and we are, we are investing there, but it's to support the human, to augment the experience, to make the humans more effective, because they, they also make mistakes. And so uh, simple examples are like, when you finished a call, we used to the agent would write up the call notes and the action points and write them up. Now AI is transcribing the call and summarizing the call and trying to pull out the action points. The agent still reviews it, but the wrap-ups are much faster. Uh, we have lots of chat macros that can respond to chats, and we will use AI to suggest which one you might send, but it won't actually choose to send it because AI is getting better at a remarkable pace. It will get the right answer more, more and more frequently. But every now and again, it makes a really non-human mistake. And that non-humans are wrong frequently, but by a little bit. AI is arguably wrong less than a human. All the stats tells you this. But when it is wrong, it's really wrong. <laughs> and that kills trust. <laughs> and so we're Indeed. putting that human in the loop effectively to stop the, those non-human mistakes going out to customers. So I had one question for you, which you already answered, which is how do you balance technology and human inter interaction? So I think you already answered that by saying that, you know, you're putting the human in front and making the human smarter. So I think it's brilliant. Uh, uh, really, you know, brings an uh, end to what I wanted to you know, really ask you. I think, um, you know, we, we're working closely together on the white paper, uh, talking about uh, how you can you know, utilize customer service to actually drive growth, while customer service may have uh, been seen as more like an expense or an investment. But you know, the growth word never was associated that frequently with customer service. I'm really excited uh, to be writing this thought paper in, in collaboration with you. Uh, and I think you know, for this audience, we will definitely have a, a preview uh, so that you know, the, this audience gets to look what's, what are the insights before the rest of the world. Brilliant. Yeah, I, I'm really looking forward to this. I think it's been a really, a really interesting piece of research to, to publish together. Fantastic. Uh, look, you know, this has been fascinating. I think uh, we, we've, we've, you know, really, you've given the secret sauce <laughs> and essentially challenged everyone to say that, you know, here's the secret sauce try and replicate it, yeah. <laughs> given that challenge. There's a Brilliant. lot to do, but yeah. Thank you so much. Really appreciate uh, Sam. Thanks. It was great having you here. <laughs> Thank you.